This video goes over the Module 1 End of Module Review. And before I go through every problem in this review, let me tell you how to use this review and use this video. I recommend you first go through this review as if it was the test, meaning you can use a calculator and you cannot use the proof toolbox. Okay, put yourself in test taking conditions and take this review as if it was the test. Okay, when you finish, compare your answers and your work with the answer key or this video. Okay, and if you look at the answer key, you still can't figure out how to get that answer, then use this video. I do not, I do not suggest that you just watch this video and you write down the work on your review. Um, and think that you understood it. Okay, that's what's called the fluency illusion. I've written this, it's in my own handwriting, I think I can do it, I get the test, and I realize in the moment of the test that I can't do it by myself. Okay, and then panic starts, anxiety starts. Um, you will be much more prepared if you do it in that process. So, with that in mind, assuming you've already tried all these problems, and you've done your best, and you still can't figure it out, Let's start with these problems. So in number one, we want to find the value of x, y, and the measures of all three labeled angles. Okay, so um, I'm looking at the left problem on number one, and I want to write an equation with only one variable. So I look at the x here and the x here, and I think to myself, how are these two angles related? Well, they're a linear pair, and we learned a long time ago that linear pairs add up to 180. So I know that 6x plus 15x plus 75 must equal 180 because they're a linear pair. It doesn't say you have to explain why, um, but that's a good habit to get into. Now, if I combine like terms, I will add 6x and 15x, and I get 21x plus 75 is equal to 180. Now, I want to get all my variables on one side, all the x's on one side, and the constant terms, the whole numbers, on the other side. I already have my x's on the left, so I want to move this plus 75 to the other side, and I do that by doing the opposite of plus 75, which is minus 75 to both sides. And I get 21 is equal to 105. Okay, and then I will divide both, well, let me back up. <laughs> I actually lost my x. Let me go back here. So I have 21x equals 105. So um, x is being multiplied by 21. The opposite of times 21 is divide 21. And x is equal to 5. Okay, so once I find x, I'm actually going to back substitute um, and plug in x into up here. So 6 times 5 is 30, okay, and that's equal to b. And I can plug x in here um, and get 15 times 5 plus 75. and I get 150. Okay, so I'm moving right along. Um, I now need to find y. And I will look right here and notice that 3y is equal to 150. Okay, those are equal because they are vertical angles. So I'll write the equation. I'm kind of running out of space. I want to leave space for that problem over there. I'm going to go over here in this little space. So I have 3y is equal to 150. Um, let's see here, y is being multiplied by 3, so the opposite of that is divide by 3 to both sides so it stays equal, and I got y is equal to 50. Okay, and again, because they're equal, um, then that means c must also be 150. Okay, so there's a lot, there's a lot in there. Okay, um, but you start with looking at an equation with only one variable. You solve the equation, you plug it in, and you're kind of on your way to kind of figure things out. Okay, in this this right equation, um, 
I have really three angles. I have this angle and this angle and this angle, okay? Um, and it's kind of screaming exterior angles. I don't know if you can hear it, but it, it's screaming to me about exterior angles. Um, and I know that with exterior angles, that the exterior angle, whoops, let me go like this. The exterior angle 126 is equal to the sum of the remote interior, meaning 126 equals 4x plus 5x. And that's the exterior angles theorem. Okay, now I will combine like terms and 4x and 5x give you 9x. So 126 is equal to 9x. And then, because 9's, x is being multiplied by 9, I will do the opposite of that by dividing both sides by 9. And x is equal to, I'm not sure why it's black, which is fine. I just want it to be color coded. Um, 126 divided by 9, and I get 14. Okay. Um, but I also need to find the measures of all the labeled angles. And so 14 times 4, 4 times 14, is 56. And 5 times 14 is 70. Okay? So those are finding some missing angles. In number two, we're asked to complete the proof. We are given that n is parallel to m. Okay, I'm going to start with my given. My first statement will be n is parallel to m, and that is given. Okay, and my goal is to prove the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle three is 180. Now, what I notice is that this proof statement has said nothing about angle two. Okay. Now, in Mr. Lewis vocabulary, I call angle 2 a helper angle. Okay. It's a stepping stone to get from 1 to 3. Okay. By the way, you should not say the same side exterior angles theorem because I'm actually proving that theorem, and so I don't want to use that theorem in its own proof. Okay. Um, so let's go back here. I'm going to talk about angles 1 and 2. And let's see here, angles 1 and 2 are corresponding angles. And if the lines are parallel, then the corresponding angles are equal in measure. So the measure of angle 1 is equal to the measure of angle 2 because they're corresponding angles. Okay, that's nice to know. And then I look at 2 and 3. How are they related? Well, they're not the same, okay? But they do make a linear pair. And I know that linear pairs are supplementary. They add to 180 because they make a straight line. So the measure of angle 2 plus the measure of angle 3 is equal to 180, and that's because they're a linear pair. Okay, and finally, putting those pieces together, um, I can substitute angle 1 in for angle 2, and I get the measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 3 is 180, okay? And that's the substitution property of equality. And that's it. Okay, number 3 is to prove that the measures of interior angles of a triangle sum to 180, this is the triangle angle sum theorem. Now let me remind you, I am proving the triangle angle sum theorem. You cannot use that theorem for any of your reasons. Okay, it's circular reasoning to use the thing you're proving in its own proof. So don't do it. Okay, now let me give you a warning. Um, when we learned this before, I was not making a huge deal about start with the given. You can, uh, for the first statement, write down the given and have the reason be given. That's fine. Okay. If you do that, you'll have an extra line at the bottom, which is also fine. You can feel free to add more statements, 
um, but you don't have to. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the way we started this before, and that is by looking at angles 1, 2, and 3. Okay, those are not, they're not a linear pair because there's more than 2. Um, if there's like a linear, you know, 3, you know, triad or something, um, that's not really a thing though. But I do know that they make a straight line. So the measure of angle, I'm actually going to use a, a, a sneaky order to kind of follow this order. Um, angle 2 plus the measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 3 is 180. Okay, it's a weird order to put them in, but it's going to make it so that when I'm done, I have the exact proof statement, um, which is kind of a nice thing to do in proof. Okay, And the reason is these three angles make a straight line. Um, I think I'll call these three angles form a line. That's good. Something about forming a line is a good thing to do. Okay, so I'm given that AD is parallel to BC. So this is parallel to this. And so I have some parallel line stuff that I could use. Specifically, I notice that angle 4 and angle 1 are alternate interior angles. And if the lines are parallel, then the measure of angle 1 is equal to the measure of angle 4. That's because they're alternate interior angles. Similarly, um, angle 3 and angle 5 are also alternate interior angles. And so their measures are the same. So the measure of angle 3 is equal to the measure of angle 4. Just kidding, 5. Now, I can plug in, let's see here, angle 4 in for 1, and I can plug 5 in for 3. And I get the measure of angle 2 plus the measure of angle 4 plus the measure of angle 5 equals 180. And the reason is not triangle angle sum theorem. Okay, it's not. I can't use that theorem in its own proof. What I will use, I'm doing substitution. So it's a substitution property of equality. Number four. Now, <laughs> on number four on this left one, I actually made a mistake when I was making it. Um, number four actually goes off the graph. So some students have asked me so far, hey, um, it goes off the graph. Is that okay? Uh, and the answer is, yeah, I made a mistake. Um, so, so I'm still going to do this as you know as it's written, but it does go off the graph as I rotate. Now, the way you do rotations is I look to see how to get from the point from the center to the point. It's always from the center. So point A, I'm going clockwise 90 degrees. I guess I'll come to that later on. To get from D to A, I'm going to go left 2 and up 3. Okay, and now I'll rotate these arrows, this left arrow and up arrow. Now one thing that I've realized this year teaching it is this little compass um, it's kind of helpful for a lot of students. So let me show you that to you. Um, I have this compass. Okay, um, It's just arrows up, down, left, right. Um, and I'm going clockwise. I'm going to follow the clock and I kind of can draw out this little compass um, to kind of remind me which way to go. So if I was going left, it's hard to, to like draw this because you can't see me point at things. Okay, If I was going left, um, now I'm going to go I'm not going to actually draw on that because it's going to be too hard. If I was going left, I'm now going up. Okay, if I was going left, I'm now going to go up. Hopefully you can just see that kind of going clockwise. Two. If I was going up, now I'm going right. Three. Okay, so from the center, I'm going to go up two, and I'm going to go right three. And this point right here, this point right here is that point. Um, is a prime. I'm trying to not have my arrow stay there because by the end it would look pretty complicated if I did. Okay, point B to get from the center to the point, I'm going to go up. Let's see here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Count the spaces. I'm going to go up eight. I'm going to go left, left, two. Okay, so. Um, following my compass, if I was going up, I'm now going to go right 8. If I was going left, I'm now going to go up 2. 
So from here, I'm going to go right eight, one, um, I'm going to go right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Here's where I go off the graph and students say, whoa, 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 my right. Um, and it's, I made a mistake, so I'm sorry about that. So I go kind of over two spaces-ish. Um, just make your best guess. And I go up two spaces, and I'm here-ish. The best I can kind of write it out. This is B prime. Okay. Um, next, I'll go red. Um, let's find C. Um, to find C, I'm going to go up. How far? One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to go up six. I'm going to go right two. Okay. Following my compass, I'm going to go, if I was going up, now I'm going right six. If I'm going right, now I'm going down two. So from the center point, we erase this so I don't get too complicated by the end. I'm going to go right one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm right on that edge. Down two. This point right here is C prime. Connect the dots. Bump, bump, bump. Okay? So that's rotating it counter, sorry, clockwise 90 degrees around point D. Okay. Um, the second one, reflect, um, reflect triangle ABC over X equals zero. So I need to find the places where X is equal to zero. Well, here's one place that X equals zero, which is kind of tricky because you kind of look at on the x and the y axis. To find that, this doesn't tell you which one it is. Okay, But keep in mind that this is all the places where x is 0. So x is 0 here because the point is 0, 5. Right? x is 0. Down here, it's 0, negative 5. So this line right here, this line right here is all the places where x is equal to 0. Okay, Or memorize that x equals a number is always vertical. And y equals zero is always a horizontal, or y equals something is always a horizontal line. So that's the most common thing I, I see as a mistake right there. But once you have your line, you count how far away the point is from the line. Uh, point A is one to the left, so I go one to the right. That's A prime. Point B is one, two, three away, so I go on the other side, one, two, three, and I get right here is B prime. C is 1, 2, 3, 4. I go on the other side, 1, 2, 3, 4, and I get the point C prime. I connect the dots. Yep, like that. Okay? It's okay that it crosses itself. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. In number five, you want to find the lines of reflectional symmetry and the angle of rotational symmetry. I'm trying to pack as much as I can into, into this review. So, reflectional symmetry I'll do in green. Um, this is a regular octagon. So I have, I think students are, are, can see it here, and here, and here, and here. Okay, those should all intersect this at the same point. I'm just being very generous with where that center is. Okay, but it's also here and here and here and here. Okay, there are eight lines of symmetry. Okay, for the um, parallelogram, there's actually no reflectional symmetry. Okay. If you don't believe me, then get a piece of paper and cut out a um, parallelogram and then try to fold it so it lines up on itself and you'll find out very quickly that none of the fold you could ever think of would work. Okay, Because there is no reflectional symmetry be on a parallelogram because of how it's leaning. Um, the fact that it's leaning um, eliminates any chance of reflectional symmetry. Okay, rotational symmetry in blue. Now this is kind of hard to do on a smart board because um, I can't like turn the piece of paper. Okay, but think about you know turning it. Um, this point, if I rotated it, would eventually get to here, and then here, and then this point would be there too, and this point, and this point, and this point, and this point, and this point. So it would look the exact same as I rotate it around one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times, and I've gone 360 divided by 8 is 45 degrees. Okay. Now it's not 8 
because there were eight lines of reflectional symmetry. And it's, it was not eight because it was, had eight sides. Okay? That does happen with regular polygons, okay? but it does not happen with most shapes. Okay, for example, this um, parallelogram does have rotational symmetry. As I move this point, we'll eventually get to exactly here, and then this point will go back here. It looks the exact same exactly two times. Okay, look, notice it's not four. At being four sides, it happens two times. And so 360 divided by two is 180 degrees. So it has 180 degree rotational symmetry. Okay, number six, are the following triangles congruent? If not, explain why not. If they are congruent, find specific rigid motions that map one onto the other and write a congruence statement. Okay, now you can start anywhere and end anywhere. Um, I'm just going to randomly pick to start with this one because it's kind of on the left-ish and I kind of read left to right. So. I'm going to start with that one, although you can totally start with the other triangle. This is the kind of problem that's really hard to grade, to be honest, as a teacher, um, because there's like so many ways you can do this and do it correctly. So as long as you use rigid motions and get to the other one, you're fine. Okay. Um, the thing that I'm going to choose to do is, let's see here. Um, I mean, there's lots of ways to go. I'm going to reflect. Um, I, I can see that I need to have a reflection at some point. So I'm going to reflect um, triangle. I'm just going to call it um, PQR. That's alphabetical order. PQR um, over the x-axis. Okay. So I, I said reflection, I said where I'm starting, I specifically named which line, and you could pick other lines as well, but um, I'll just pick over the x-axis. So this is my x-axis, um, r goes, r prime is here, q prime is here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, this point right here is p prime. So I have this right here as my... Um, as my reflection. Okay, notice that it looks the exact same, I just need to translate it by the end. So that leads me to my next rigid motions is I will um, translate, I'm going to call this triangle P prime Q prime R prime um, by the translation rule of X comma Y arrow. Um, now in the X direction, I'm just thinking about Q. Q will go from here, I'm going to go this far over and then that far up. So I'm going to go up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I'm going to go x from the previous x. I'm going to go x plus 9. And then the y, I'm going to go up. So y will be y plus 2. Okay? Okay. And that would, I'm going to be sneaky here, use my smart board to my advantage. If I go this way, 9 up 2, bing, I get the exact same. Well, let me just be kind, okay? I get the exact same triangle. Every point maps on to, on to the other corresponding point, okay? Um, so I'm going to go back up here and say yes. Um, so triangle PQR is congruent to triangle. Now the correspondence is P maps to M, Q maps to O, and R maps to N, okay? Um, and the reason is, I'm not going to write it out here, but um, I found rigid motion snap one onto the other. That's the definition of congruence. Okay, a lot of questions have come up about number seven, so it's a good one to, to talk about. This question seven says, use the images below to explain how the criteria for side angle side triangle congruence criteria follows from the definition of congruence. So first of all, which rigid motions were used? Okay, this was a translation. Okay, and actually, I'm going to be a little more precise here. Um, so first, a translation um, along um, A prime A, okay, along that vector, okay? Number two, I'm going to say it's a rotation um, centered 
at a um, until until c. I'm going to use the mapping maps onto c. Just kidding. <laughs> until c double prime maps onto c. And third, it's a reflection. over a c okay so as long as you had translation rotation reflection um, then i was happy because um, the other important point is the second question how does this prove the side angle side triangle congruence criteria um, is that we used rigid motions to map one triangle onto the other. Okay, we did similar things for side side side, and I believe angle side angle. Um, and so you can use, you can prove these criteria um, using rigid motions. And, and these rigid motions basically are the ones we used every single time. So now that I have those criteria, I can now use them to prove things about triangles um, in a more rigorous way than using rigid motions. So here we go. I'm given that AB is equal to AC, um, and that's because it's given, okay? And then we've done a tricky thing. We've drawn in AD, the angle bisector of angle A. That's an auxiliary line. I can draw that however I want, okay? So because it's an angle bisector, that means that the measure, I'm just gonna call it angle, angle BAD, <laughs> bad, um, is congruent to angle CAD, okay, that this angle is equal to this angle by the definition of angle bisector. Okay, so um, I feel like I've used all of my given, okay? Um, so I'm kind of going to move on from there, look at the diagram, um, and oh, don't forget that AB, I was given that this is true, so I'll just kind of keep that in mind that I've been given that. Um, let's see here. I'm looking at the diagram, and I notice that AD is the same length as AD, so AD is congruent to AD, and that's the reflexive property. And I decided to use congruence for, any, for some reason, so I used property of congruence. Okay. And now, looking at the two triangles I have, um, the two triangles are, by the way, I have triangle, um, I'll just use BAD, is congruent to triangle CAD. Okay. And in those two triangles, I have two sides and the angle in between. So these are congruent by the side, angle, side, um, congruence criteria. Okay. And once I have congruent, um, congruent triangles, I now know that angle B must be congruent to angle C because they're corresponding parts of congruent triangles. Therefore, they must be congruent, CPCTC. Okay, um, number nine, along with eight, um, are theorems that are mentioned in our standards. Okay, this one I don't think we've went over in class, but it's, um, it is a good one to be aware of. Okay, we'll, we'll prove that, that a point on the perpendicular bisector of a segment is equidistant from the two endpoints. So I can think of this like as a triangle, but truth is that point J can be any point on the perpendicular bisector of KL, meaning that JR is perpendicular to KL and KR is the same length as RL. So that's been given to us, okay? And I'm already gonna give you that, uh, that angle jerk, <laughs> angle JRK is congruent to angle JRL because they're perpendicular. That's already given to you, okay? So these are also the same. These are the same right here and these are the same. So um, they really gave us quite a bit in the given. Um, the one piece I was missing is JR is congruent to JR, and that's by the reflexive property. And I choose to use congruent, so it's property of congruence. You could have done equality as well, I just chose congruence. Okay, draw on the diagram. 
And if I draw in the diagram, then I notice that triangle um, JRK, JRK is congruent to J corresponds with J, R corresponds with R, and K corresponds with L. Um, by, now I have two sides and the angle between, it's by the side, angle, side um, congruence criteria. And then if I have congruent triangles, then JK, <laughs> JK is congruent to JL because they're corresponding parts of congruent triangles, so they must be congruent. All right, in number 11, um, we will complete the following proof that the diagonals of a parallelogram bisect each other. Okay, so um, I'm given parallelogram ABCD, and AD must be parallel to BC. Okay, and that's by the definition of parallelogram. Now, I could have also said that AB is parallel to DC, because that's part of the definition. Um, but it is, it is kind of slick in a proof to only use the statements that are necessary, to kind of leave out the um, excess things you don't really need. It's kind of a clean, slick proof. So I'll, I'll follow that pattern and just talk about AD and BC. Okay? Now, um, one property we proved on the same day we proved this one was that AD is the same length as BC, and we called that a property of parallelograms. It wasn't the definition, but it was a property that we proved about uh, parallelograms. So because I was given a parallelogram, I can go ahead and use that property. Okay, let's see here. I think um, there's a couple places to go with this. So there's multiple paths um, through this proof, and either way you have to deal with some alternate interior angles, okay? And you could choose either the one up here or the one down here. Um, for some reason, I'm gonna pick the one up here, okay? So these two are alternate interior angles, and I have angle DAE is congruent to angle BCE because they're alternate interior angles. Now, I think when I did my answer key, I did this first and was making this, and I said six statements. Um, I think I was accounting for both of them. And you can also do, by the way, both of them. But I know enough of students, when they've been doing this, have been using vertical angles, because I've kind of drilled that in pretty well. Um, so I'm gonna, in this proof, I'm going to kind of go past my six statements, and I'm going to use the vertical angles as my other, um, as my other angle that I'm going to use. Okay. So you could say angle AED is congruent to angle um, CEB by the vertical angles theorem. Okay. So going this path, um, I now have the triangle. Um, I'm just going to call it AED again. Is congruent to triangle CEB. Okay, and looking at the two triangles, I have two angles and a side not in between, so it's by angle, angle, side. Okay, now notice that if you did choose the two alternate interior angles, you would have ended up with angle, side, angle. So again, there's multiple paths through this, um, through this proof, okay, and, and they're, they're correct. So statement seven, because I did this in two statements instead of one, um, I will say that AE... Um, is congruent to um, EC and DE is congruent to EB and that's by corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. Okay, And that proves that the diagonals of a, perpendic of a parallelogram uh, bisect each other. Okay, let's also prove that the opposite angles of a parallelogram are congruent. Okay, and again, I start with a parallelogram ABCD, okay, because it's given. I'm given that AB is parallel to DC and AD is parallel to BC. You draw in, it's always good to draw on the diagram. Hopefully, you've heard that enough from me. Draw on the diagram, draw on the diagram. OK, 
Okay, and this is the definition of parallelogram. Okay, now remember that property that we talked about that we had proved earlier in class that in a parallelogram the opposite sides are the same length. I'm going to utilize that exact property and say that a b um, segment a b is congruent to segment c d and segment a d is congruent to segment b c. Okay, now that does mean it's always true that you can just exchange parallel with the same length. Okay, it does happen in a parallelogram because we proved it. And this is a property of parallelograms. Okay, again, you can only use this when you have a been given a parallelogram. Okay, um, I will next. Um, again, there's there's both ways to get to this one as well. Um, as long as you get there by the end, that's fine. Like you could have used some alternate interior angles. Uh, for some reason, the first thing I saw in this proof was that property. And then I'm going to use that BD um, is congruent to BD by the reflexive property. Okay, And then I'm going to use um, that triangle um, BAD. BAD is congruent to triangle so here, B corresponds with D, um, A corresponds with C, and D corresponds with B by side, side, side. I didn't draw on the diagram, so I may have lost you. Okay, so I feel like I'm kind of going a little bit fast in this, um, and that's because there's multiple ways to do this, and I want to have this discussion real quick. Um, and that is that I use this property that is in green um, to get the opposite sides, and then I have reflexive property, so I have side, side, side. If you instead had used reflexive property and like um, alternate interior angles, then you would have gotten angle side angle. So again, there's multiple paths through this, and this is just one of them. Okay, but now that I have congruent triangles, um, I can now say that angle BAD is congruent to angle DCB because they're corresponding parts of congruent triangles, so they must be congruent. On number 13, um, a surveyor needs to measure the distance PQ across a lake. Uh, beginning at point S, um, she locates the midpoint of SQ and SP, um, M at M and N, she then measures NM to be um, 78 meters. So how long is this? Well, um, because it's the midpoint, I know that NM is a mid segment. And the two properties we should know about mid segments is it's parallel. And most importantly for this problem is it's half the length. Hey, half the length. So 78 is half the length of across the um, across the lake, and so that means that PQ must be equal to 156 meters. Okay. And point and number 14 um, is that G is the centroid of triangle ABC. Use the given information to find the value of X. Okay. So, um, GC is right here, and that length is 3x plus 7, okay? And CE, this whole length, is 6x. So I think about how is CG and CE related, and CG, that, that is 2 thirds, because the centroid um, to the vertex is two-thirds of the entire median length. So CG is two-thirds of CE. Okay, I can now plug in 3x minus 7 into CG and 6x into CE, and I get 3x plus 7 is equal to two-thirds times 6x. Now, how do you multiply two-thirds times 6x? Well, 
I think it multiplying fractions, you multiply the tops together and the bottoms together. 2 times 6x is 12x. 3 times 1 is 3. And 12x divided by 3 is 4x. So bringing this down, 3x plus 7 and 3x plus 7. Um, now this is looking more like things that I'm used to solving. Okay, And I want to get my variables on one side and the constant terms, the whole numbers on the other. I already have my whole numbers together on the left, so I will move this 3x to the right by subtracting 3x from both sides. And I get 7 is equal to, let's see here, 4x minus 3x is x, and that is the answer. Okay, on the second problem, fg is um, x, let's see, erase this and kind of look at this again. Fg, this little part, is x plus 8. And af, this length right here, is 9x minus 6. So how are fg and af related? Let's see here. From the centroid to the midpoint, that's the short end. And that is one-third of the length of the entire median. So um, fg is equal to one-third of the entire median of af. So I can plug in fg in here and af in here, and I get the equation x plus 8 is equal to one-third of 9x minus 6. And I'm remembering that I'll need some more space in this problem. Um, I'm going to move this over a little bit um, and move this over a little bit. Um, and just for clarity, I'm going to go back and kind of redraw these arrows. I need some more space later on. So this goes here, and this goes here. Okay, so um, let's kind of think about solving this. Okay, so um, one-third distributes kind of nicely into this binomial because they're both multiples of 3. So one-third of 9x is, let's see here, 9x divided by 3, which is 3x. And 1 third times 6 is 6 divided by 3, which is 2. So you get 3x minus 2 on that side. This is just the x plus 8. Okay, now, again, I'm solving this equation. I want to get my x's on one side, my whole numbers on the other. Um, I have kind of some of each on each side. So I like moving my smaller x. And so this is my smaller x. I will subtract x from both sides. And I get 8 is equal to, let's hear, 3x's minus x is 2x minus 2. And then I will, um, let's see here, I have my x's on the right. I'll get the whole numbers on the left. I'm going to add 2 to both sides. And I get 10 is equal to 2x. Okay, I'm just so close at the bottom. I'm just going to keep going at the bottom. Um, Let's go back to this color. So um, x is being multiplied by 2. So the opposite is to divide by 2, divide by 2. And I get x is equal to 5. Yeah, find the value of x, which I did. And that's the end. Okay. So um, this video went over every problem on the module 1 end of module review. Again, Please try this on your own and then check your answers, watch this video, again try it again, okay, pull out old worksheets, I have worksheets, I have um, other work that we've done uh, that you can go back to review. Um, please be active in how you are preparing for this test by trying problems you've done before or trying new problems. Um, just watching videos passively is not the best use of your study time, okay. I hope you do well. Thank you for watching.